to understand the Bible. That is to say, how to understand the Bible. How to understand our Father's Word. How to read with understanding. For many years I have seen people of different denominations do battle over the meaning of certain verses or phrases used in the Bible. I have seen them argue and scoff at each other or even judge each other to be fools when most likely neither one of them were exactly correct. Yet they argue and all because of what they were taught or told. In other words, what they heard rather than what they learned from deeper study into the Bible. Many people sit in church and eat whatever they're dished out from the pulpit just because the pulpit represents a holy place and those who are supposed to be teaching them are considered to have understanding and most people just let it go with that well the good pastor said so so that must be the way it is I have seen the Bible misquoted or a verse turned around 180 degrees from what was actually intended. I have seen masses of people being taught things which are not even written in our Father's Word. All because of religious urban myth or traditional doctrine, which is to say traditional teachings, which would be what a certain denomination of a church teaches. If you read something in the Bible in English which seems to contradict something else written in the Bible, then here is a good rule of thumb. Don't assume it's correct, because God nor Christ ever contradict themselves or each other, for they are the same. And a little study into the old languages will clarify most any mistake you find that was made by the translators who translated our Father's Word into English. In this study we are going to look at what is needed for understanding our Father's Word. What is needed, which is to say, to unlock the key of David, to see things which most people don't, to see things hidden from the foundations of the world. First of all, you need love of the truth and a desire for answers. You can't be one of these people who just takes it as a given that what you have heard is the sole truth. Most importantly, you need to ask our Father for the wisdom to understand His Word. Ask Him to reveal things to you. Father loves to do this for those who read His letter. Now, you don't have to become a fanatic, but you do have to do some homework. The Bible is like a buried treasure. You have to do a lot of digging and look at a lot of old maps. But if you do, you'll find treasure and be rich in knowledge. The Bible is a very complicated book at times. Yet, when put into perspective and properly translated, it is simplicity to the point that children can even understand. The problem is that many read the Bible in blissful unawareness that what they are reading in English is a translation of a translation of a translation. The original Old Testament of the Bible was written in ancient Hebrew, sometimes called Phalo Hebrew, even referred to as Paleo Hebrew. And the Bible was written in certain other ancient languages such as Chaldean and Aramaic, which are dialects of the Babylonian tongue. Most assume that what they read in English, in the Bible, is verbatim. They assume that it is properly translated from what was actually written. But this is not always so. In reality, uh, reality, the Bible cannot be fully translated to a perfect clone or a perfect copy of what was actually written without adding much more language to it. Because some words in Hebrew and in Greek have tremendous meaning and carry tremendous weight. In fact, some words in the old languages would make an entire sentence in English. When we look at the uh, Hebrew of the Old Testament, the original Hebrew that is to say, we learn that Hebrew has over 9,000 words. 
And the Greek language, likewise, has also over 9,000 words. And when you take those vast amounts of words of Hebrew and Greek and try to translate them or compact them into the 43 to 4,400 words of English we use in daily speech, guess what? There will be loss. There will be incomplete conveyance of the true message. And in turn, incomplete translation or a pale version translation compared to what was actually written in the original manuscripts and texts. And this pale translation can lead to the truth being replaced by traditions, by religious urban myths. In other words, it will lead to confusion, division, and eventually to deception. And this is one of the reasons why there are so many different views, so many different beliefs, which cause division in Christianity. This is why there are so many different denominations, which is to say church letters. Whereas Christianity, the body of Christ, is supposed to be one. Let us also realize that English is a language of transition. Whereas the old languages of Hebrew and Greek are fixed languages. Meaning, they don't change meaning. English does change meaning, but uh, Greek and Hebrew do not. From generation to generation, English, many words change their meaning completely. Now, not all words, but many do. <coughs> Let's consider some of the words in English which do change meaning due to slang or colloquial use, which is to say, sayings. Let us consider a word like hot. It's most often used to define temperature. The definition, if someone says it's hot, is the temperature is high. Or if they're talking about cooking, that needs to be hot. The temperature needs to be higher. But from that meaning came the use of the word hot, meaning stolen. Or let's put it with another word. How about the word hot rod? Now most people of my generation know that hot rod means a fast, good-looking car. But hot rod is also a term used for a heated piece of metal which is in the form of a rod, a heated metal steel rod. Or a piece of nuclear enriched rod used to power re a reactor. And in the old days, a hot rod was a term for a stolen gun. Or let's consider another word like cell, C-E-L-L. -L. When I was growing up, I only knew of one meaning for the word cell, which meant a single organism or a single cell of the body. But now, cell can mean anything from a prison cell, which comes from the uh, beehive analogy. In other words, a storage place, a place of punishment, now a, a prison cell. Or a terrorist cell, meaning an extension of the master organization separated from the host and apart to itself. Or how about a sentence like this? Hey, when you get home, call me on my cell meaning a cellular phone. This is the evolution of words in English between the use of colloquialisms, which is again to say sayings, and slang or street lingo. And the old ling English, which the Bible was first translated in, uses words that are no longer in use, such as peradventure, which means suppose or what if. But we don't use those old English words anymore and the Bible has many words that we don't use anymore or words that have changed meaning. But by the same token the old languages of Hebrew and Greek do not tran uh, have transition like this. They have their own structure. They are fixed languages. However we still have to learn their colloquialisms which is to say that their, again, their structure, their sayings, and how they related to things. Their colloquialisms were different than ours. So to be able to understand the Bible, 
and understand the true translation, we must get familiar with the ancient colloquialisms of Hebrew and Greek. Or else, when we translate the Bible, we only transliterate it, which means to uh, say to find the nearest kinword for each word instead of translating the entire thought and the uh, translating it to completely conveying the thought or the message as it was written. Now, keeping these fi factors in mind, it must also be realized that there are deeper levels to the Bible beyond the printed message. In other words, besides the literal message put out, God utilizes types and examples in the Bible. So that by reading and understanding what has happened historically in the Bible, we may see and understand what is to come. Understanding these types and examples gives us a template to follow, a rehearsal of sorts, where what happened in the past by example, will bear out and be the truth of what is to come. And I will give you an example or two of what I mean about the types and examples so as to show you what I mean. Now we are all familiar with the blood of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ being shed on the cross. And because He shed that blood, we can overcome death. In other words, have salvation. But in the Old Testament, before Israel was freed from Egypt, the final plague that God put on Egypt was the taking of the firstborn son, the killing of the firstborn son. Now, God told Israel to put the blood of a lamb on their doorposts and the death angel would pass over them. Now that was a type. The blood of the Lamb protecting from the angel of death. An exact type of Christ's blood protecting us from the angel of death, Satan. And if you don't get that, I'll give you another short one. Abraham was told to take his only son up to, the, to Mount Moriah and to sacrifice him upon an altar. Now Abraham, willing to do the will of the Lord, did not question this. I'm sure he wasn't happy about it, but he did not question it because he knew that his son's soul belonged to God and it was his to do with as he pleased. So Abraham did go up to Mount Moriah and was about to plunge the dacker into his son's chest. But God stopped him. And God saw to it that a ram was caught in a tree which would be put in place of Isaac on the altar. In other words, the ram is a sheep, a lamb. It's the male of the sheep. And he took the place of Isaac on the altar, on Mount Moriah. Now Jesus Christ takes our place and died for our sins. And it just so happens that Golgotha is at Mount Moriah. Now, if you can see these examples, you will understand what I mean. They are types aforehand to show us what would come. Now, besides these factors that I've already mentioned, there are also keys in the Bible and legends as on a map to let you know or to what, what is being discussed or to show you signs which point the way. For instance... When Satan is referred to in the Bible, either as an example or as the real de facto being, if he is referred to such as the king of Tyrus in Ezekiel 28, you will notice that the word king there is in lower case. It's not capitalized. When Satan is referred to under any label, like king or lord, the Lord of the Flies, Beelzebub, it will always be in lower case. Any time you see the word king or the word lord in lower case, it is referring to Satan either himself or Satan as a type or false gods or idols. They are always in lower case and never capitalized.
And this was designed that way so that you can understand that it's not talking about the Lord God Almighty of hosts or the King of the universe. <coughs> now here's another key. All prophecies given in the Bible concerning Satan or Satan's army, his locust army, or any of those who are against God are given in nights or is to say months, which is to say m month means moons. All prophecies concerning Satan in the Bible or his army are given in months or nights. The moon, of course, being the lunar of the night in the darkness, and the moon, which causes tides to ride or tides to rise. The moon being, of course, symbolic of the lesser light compared to the sun, which is the bringer of daylight to the world, just as Jesus Christ is the real light of the world. So what you have there is another type and example. The moon is the lesser light, but it echoes the light of the sun. And this is exactly what Satan does when he claims to be Christ, or when he attempts to deceive. All prophecies concerning Christ, or Christ's return, or God's vengeance, are given in days, the solar. Another key to understanding the Bible is the use of biblical numerics, and the meaning of names in the Bible. Not only the names of people, but also of places, or dates and times. Some examples of biblical numerics would be a number corresponding to an event or to an example set forth, such as the number four. The number four in biblical numerics symbolizes earth. Now if you think about earth, think about how many things are with four. The earth has four seasons, four directions, four times of the day, morning, noon, evening, and night. The earth has four uh, main elements. Now, I know there are a lot of other elements, don't get me wrong, but I'm talking about earth, air, fire, and water. Four animal kingdoms, or I mean four kingdoms, mineral, animal, vegetable, and spiritual. And then the number four also symboli uh, symbolizes that which is earthly. Anytime you see the locust army mentioned in the Bible, you will usually find the four stages of the locust, which is earthly, the four hidden dynasties. Another biblical numerics example would be the number six, which is symbolic of man or sin, man sinfulness, or even fleshly man. Satan is referred to as the man of sin, in uh, 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, in the book of Revelations, he is referred to as the man whose number is 6, 3 score and 6, which is 666. Six, six. Saturn. We know we have nine planets. Saturn, which is symbolic of Satan, which comes from the name Satan, is the sixth planet. The earth which is earthly, which is to say this flesh age was created in six days, since God rested on the seventh and did no work. And in that there is another example, the number seven. The number seven means completeness or spiritual completeness. The week has seven days by the Gregorian calendar, and seven completes the week to start again. Just as Jesus returns at the seventh trump to end this flesh age of man, and begin the millennium and the start of the new earth age. And of course, eight being symbolic of new beginnings. Eight Adamic souls on the ark with Noah, which began uh, the new world after the flood. And of course, the number 40 being symbolic of probation. It rained 40 days and 40 nights. And on it goes. Even the number 13 has symbology. 13 symbolizes rebellion. But outside the Bible we have uh, lessons of the number 13. At the same time we have them in the Bible. There are 
12 tribes of Israel, but if you count the half-tribe of Ephraim and Manasseh, you get 13. America began with 13 colonies. 13 American colonies rebelled against the British Empire, England, the United Kingdom. In, in turn, during the American Civil War, 13 Confederate states rebelled. They were even called rebels against the Union. And all of these numbers have deeper meaning in and out the Bible. Just as a number is utilized for a date or a birthday or an event, though, doesn't necessarily mean that it's holy. In other words, if a child is born on the 13th day of the month, and he turns 13 on the 13th day of the month, it doesn't necessarily mean he's rebelling. Although rebellion is a part of youth and usually begins around that time. But in this you can see that numbers have a deeper meaning besides to count in the Bible. Now as an example of names in the Bible and their meaning, let's consider the name Moses. Moses means one drawn from the water. And Moses was pulled from the river by the daughter of Pharaoh. Also having to do with Moses being the, of the living water. If you recall, Moses gave water in the desert from the stone. These are deeper meanings. Moses was the lawgiver. And God's law is the living water. Not only his law, but bringing forth with the truth, the living water, out of bondage. And then, of course, there's other names in the Bible which have similar connotations, like Zerubbabel, which means born in Babel, born in Babylon. Or the name Achan. Achan means trouble. And if you don't know who Achan is, Achan was the one who took of the accursed thing when he was told not to, when God told the tribes of Israel not to take of the accursed thing. And for his transgression, he was killed and all of his family with him. Achor and Achan mean trouble. And the name Abraham. Abraham means the father of many nations. Abraham was the father of Isaac who begat Jacob, who was Israel, and who was the father of the twelve men who would become the patriarchs of the twelve tribes of Israel. And Jacob's brother, also a grandson of Abraham, would become the children of Edom, who became called later the Rus and migrated to the land of Russia. Named after those people. Another thing you might want to realize is that in Hebrew there is no word for grandson or great-grandson. If someone is called someone's son, it means they are of their seed line. Just as Jesus Christ was called the son of David. He wasn't actually the son of David, he was the son of God. He had no earthly father. But he's called the son of David because of the seed line he came through. But it doesn't say he is the grandson or the great, 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 great grandson. Now, Abraham also fathered Ishmael, who through Ishmael's 13 sons would come the Arab people, the, the Arabians. And Abraham had other wives, from which would come other nations, the Medianites, the Moabites, and the Ammonites. And it goes on and on and on. These, of course, would be the people of Ammon and the countries surrounding the Middle East, other than the uh, Muslim people, the, the Arab seed line. All the names in the Bible have some deeper relevance. Our Lord and Savior, to us, is Jesus. But that is a Greek translation of what his name actually was, which was to say, Yahshua. For there are no J's in the Hebrew. Even Joshua, the son of Nun, who took over the tribes of Israel after Moses and led them, was not called Joshua, he was called Yahshua. Same name. The name Yahshua means God's Savior. He would also be called, Christ would also be called Emmanuel, which means God with us, or God dwelling with man, as he did in the flesh, as Jesus. 
But with the knowledge of these types and examples, these numbers and these names and these deeper meanings, coupled with the understanding of language and structure, the old languages that is to say, and keeping the subject and object in mind, we can learn the real message from the Bible, even the deeper messages. You might say that hidden manna. And you can see this as long as you keep the five W's in mind. And that is who, what, where, when, and why. Who was speaking and who was being addressed. What were they talking about? Where did this happen? And where was it going? When did it happen? And why did it happen? <clears throat> when you do this, then you can accurately translate the Bible as it was intended. For the deeper study and for the deeper scholar, there are also study tools which you can use to help you clarify things in the Bible, such as the Strong's Exhaustive Concordance of the Bible. The Strong's Exhaustive Concordance is a dictionary of the meanings of all the words used in the Bible. It is a Greek, uh, Greek and Hebrew dictionary. And it will explain each word and what each word meant and how that word's meaning came about and what the etymology of the word is. In other words, what its parent word was. With this, you can gain clear understanding as to what was actually being talked about. Because when these things are translated into English, a lot of this is lost and you have to realize that. And I know that there's people out there that will say, oh, well, if you go into the Bible and you change anything, you're going to hell. God said not to change anything. Well, when you study from the old languages, you are not changing anything. You are correcting what was mistakenly translated because of the limited amount of words that English has. And when I say we speak 43 to 4,400 words of English, I mean now. When the Bible was translated in 1611, there weren't that many. So you see the difficulty. Now, besides the Strong's Concordance, there is the Masara. The Masara are the original Hebrew footnotes of the Bible. And the word Masara means to transfer a thought from my mind to your mind, from generation to generation, with nothing being lost. The Masara is that which locks the languages of the Bible to their true original conveyance. In the Masara, you can find hidden acrostics and spellings of the Bible so that you may actually learn how to spell the things which are written in the Bible. Besides this, there is the Apocrypha. The Apocrypha is a group of books which were removed for one reason or another by the people who translated the 1611 King James Bible from which all other Bibles are translated, even the newest Bibles of the various different types, they're all translated from the same things. And the Apocrypha by Goodspeed has books in it which were taken out of the original canon of the Bible, such as Second Esdras, which is to say Second Ezra, or the Book of Maccabees, as well as others. Now again, the Bible is a complicated book, but people make it a lot more complicated than it has to be. Because God has put it in such a simplistic way that if you properly translate, if you go and dig for the answers, then you're going to get a passing grade. It's just like in college. You can't cheat. You can't go and sit in church and just be told how it is. You have to go and do the study for yourself. If you go to attend college... You, uh, you have to read a lot of old books and you have to study and you are to be tested on it. And the Bible is no different. God puts tests out for us daily. But there are bigger tests coming. Which God will gauge to see whether you ever delved into his word or not. Or whether you packed yourself into a church on Sunday and sat there yawning and listened to what was dished out to you from the pulpit and believed it. Because there are a lot of men now who are pastors, preachers, clergy of all sorts, 
who when they go to Bible Seminary College are taught doctrinally or traditionally. They're not necessarily taught to go into the original languages. Of course, they do delve into it. You couldn't very well go to college and uh, claim to think that you know something or claim that you've labored at learning if they didn't delve into some of it. But the problem is they don't delve into the colloquialisms. They don't understand the structure of the speech. They transliterate rather than translating. And this is why we have so many different denominations now, why we have so many beliefs. And people will argue with you till they are blue in the face at times. They will argue with you and tell you that you're going to hell, and they'll judge you and tell you that you're a fool or what have you. Even when you're trying to show them something. This is one reason why Christ said, don't cast your pearls before swine. Meaning, don't cast your jewels, your pearls of wisdom, before those who eat slop. And a lot of people take everything in the Bible to mean something extreme. They take it to the most extreme thing that it could mean, rather than what it does mean. In doing so, they make our Father out at times to be hateful, or to be merciless. They teach things which are not even written in the Bible. Lots of times they graft things from uh, other eras into what they believe of the Bible and scare people to death. They scare people to death with a bunch of doctrine and a bunch of words that really are not in the Bible. Oh, they look like they are in English. I'll grant you, they do look like they are in English. There are plenty of places in the Bible where it looks like it says something really horrible. But if you go and check those words out in the Greek language in the New Testament or the Hebrew of the Old Testament, that you will find that most of the time, they're unfounded. Yet, people have been brainwashed this for generations. They have been packed into churches and believing these same doctrines over and over and over because they're afraid to believe any different. They're afraid to stand up and ask questions. They get in a cult-like mentality. They're afraid to speak against their pastor. And I don't mean get up and cause a ruckus in church. I mean to question him and say, where did you come up with this? Why do you teach this? Because that's not what's written in the Hebrew. Now, I don't claim to be an expert on the Bible. I've studied in it for quite a few years, actually a couple of decades or more, and through all these years, I have learned many things from the Bible, and I know now why people teach what they teach, but most of the time it's due to they don't have the complete translation, or they believe something that's written a certain way in English, which in the original manuscripts doesn't even say what they believe. But because it sounds like it does in English, because of the way English is structured, then they make an entire belief out of it. And then, of course, you have the other style of pastor, who gets up on stage and gives you a feel-good lesson, or a lesson of things you should already know. You know whether you're good or evil. You know you're supposed to be kind to your and love your neighbor. You know you're supposed to help those that are misfortunate and be charitable. We're supposed to be extensions of Christ. But too many people pack into church to hear that same message over and over and over. Or to hear salvation and baptism, salvation and baptism. You even have a great multitude of people who, once they believe on Jesus Christ, think if they ever sin again, that they have to go and get saved all over again. They think that Christ's blood is not sufficient for them to be forgiven of sins. And again, all of this comes down from urban myth, from genre, from tradition. At any rate, if you study the Bible as it was intended, if you go into the old languages, if you study on all the levels that I have showed you here, you may be one of those who has eyes to see. 
or you may come to the knowledge. But above all else, you need to ask your father to aid you in your study. Ask him to give you the hunger to st for study. Ask him to reveal his deeper truths to you. Ask him to show you that which is hidden or what others don't see. Ask him to keep you from deception. It pleases our Father when you do this. He's not some heartless deity out in space. He is your Father. He is your closest li living relative, your next of kin. He wouldn't have come here and dwelt in this nasty flesh with, with human beings and put himself through the pain that he put himself through and the anguish and the hurt from his children denying him and crucifying him if he didn't love us. This is why it is written that God is long-suffering. And to understand the Bible, you have to go to the deeper levels. You cannot just assume that what you've heard is the truth and you cannot assume that what is written in English is the absolute truth. Many places in the Bible are translated perfectly, while others are 180 degrees off. There comes to mind, when I say that, one particular place. Jesus Christ said, Unless a man hate his mother, brother, father, and sister, he cannot follow me. Okay, well that's what it says in English. But that's not what it says in the original Greek. In the original Greek it says, if you're going to follow me, you must love your mother, father, sister, or brother less than me. In other words, Christ has to be number one. Because there are going to be events happen where brother will fight against brother for a belief. It cannot be so with God. You have to put God first. You have to put Christ first. And there are many other places in the Bible where God called for a certain group of people to be wiped out. And many use this because of their ignorance of the truth, their ignorance of understanding, to say, well, God is unjust. God is not fair. He chose this group of people over that group of people. Well, to understand this, you have to find out why he did this. In the cases I'm speaking of, God told Joshua to go into the land and the plains and to kill off massive groups of people and to leave no men, women, or children. But why did he do that? Well, because these people had interbred with fallen angels, just as written in Genesis chapter 6. In Genesis chapter 6, the fallen angels came and God flooded the world in the time of Noah. The Hebrew word is geber and Nephilim. Nephilim means fallen angels and Geber means their offspring, which is to say the giants, the giants of the Bible. When you read of giants in the Bible, mighty men of renown, this is who is being referred to, a hybrid between a human and an angelic being. And I know I'm going to shock many people with that one, so oh, I've never heard of that. Well, it's plainly written in Hebrew, but by the same token, there was another influx after the flood of Noah and God promised he would never destroy the world by flood again. So, this is one of Satan's plans. He came into the world and brought his fallen angels and they tried to corrupt the seed line through which Christ would be born and Israel, or that is to say the children of Israel. He persecuted the woman who brought forth the man-child, which is to say Mother Israel. But his fallen angels came here and inbred. They took them to wives, and to them were born offspring, which is to say hybrids, geber, giants, like Goliath, David and Goliath. And this is why God told Joshua to go and destroy all these people, because they had intermixed with fallen angels. They had bred with them. They were not perfect in their generations, as was Noah. Now I realize we're talking about two different spans of time here. Noah is early Genesis and Joshua is you know, uh, mid-Old uh, Testament. Or not mid actually, but not quite that far. But by the same token, this is why Joshua and the tribes of Israel were told to go and wipe out these people. 
because they had the seed line of the fallen angels. So God is not fair. God does not play favorites. God created all people and all races, and he created them the way he liked them. And unless you dig into the Bible, into the old languages, or at least do a little bit of study, you will not see these things and you will not understand them. And more than likely, you will be deceived. Because, again, there are many things out there being taught right now which are not biblical at all. They're not even written. There's not even words for them in the Bible. And I have many other studies on these subjects, such as the rapture and the deception, the four hidden dynasties, New Babylon, the one world government rising, Satan's seed, Cain's progeny, the Antichrist, parts 1, 2, and 3, and various others. They're all listed under just thoughts. At any rate, I hope this has helped you. I hope you will gain some better understanding from looking at these things that I have tried to show you. It is what I have learned over many years of studying the Bible. And it is my prayer and hope for you that you will study the Bible, that you will keep yourself from the deception, that you will ask God for His counsel and for His wisdom, and ask Him to reveal His truth to you. I hope you will dig into the Bible and become rich, as I have, in knowledge, so that you won't be deceived by the big test that is soon to come. Because many people out there going to church right now are ripe for deception through just what they believe. This is why it's written in the book of Amos chapter 8, and I mention this in most all of my lectures, and I'm sorry if I sound repetitive. But in Amos chapter 8, it says, The famine for the end times is for hearing the word of God. It's not for bread. It's for hearing the word of God. Man liveth not by bread alone, but by every word, every word which proceedeth from the mouth of God. And if you study the Bible, instead of just taking a verse here and a verse there and building an entire religion on them, then you shouldn't be deceived. Because if you have ten people doing one mathematical problem, they should all come up with the same answer. And if they don't come up with the same answer, then they shouldn't be allowed to say, well, that's my interpretation of how that math should be worked. God's Word is not like that. There are certain things in the Bible that you can take as personal interpretation. But there are other things you cannot. Because if you do, you will be deceived. At any rate... I hope this has helped you, and I hope you will buckle down and study your Father's Word so that you won't be deceived. Thank you for taking the time to listen to this. This has been Just Thoughts.